of Royal Roads University. And uh, primarily what I teach are, are environmental courses in the tourism and outdoor recreation department. And um, I, um, I see myself as a naturalist, as somebody who loves the outdoors, started more on the recreation side, but certainly in being outdoors all the time, um, I grew to love the natural world. No, but then that and stopped you from doing your work. I'm done. Or I'm yeah. just finished. Oh, okay. Sure. I think we have somebody maybe who's not muted. There we go. Yeah, we can ask um, everybody to and, hit mute. Yeah, and I and I so I came I came to love the natural world and uh, uh, in in being outdoors and one of them were was birds and bird calls. And my wife and I had an opportunity to go to New Zealand just before the pandemic in 2019, and one of the highlights of my time down there was a dawn chorus on a little island called Tiri Tiri off Auckland. And so for me, when I travel, uh, without a doubt, one of the highlights of traveling is listening to birds. And uh, this is the time of year for anybody who is traveling outside of your home for, uh, for birds now. So I was really pleased when um, Carmen got in touch with me and asked me to do this because the idea of a dawn course is close to my heart. Um, I get so much pleasure out of listening to birds when I'm outside. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. And um, Jesse, that means I'm going to stop admitting people. So if there's anybody else to admit, I won't probably, I won't see that. Okay, to try that again. Share sound. No. Sorry, I'm going to try that one more time. There we go. Did it work that time? Am I uh, correct? Can, Carmen, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen just fine. Perfect. Okay, so I think this is probably a good place to start. And uh, I said that I'm an instructor at Capilano University uh, and I teach students in the tourism and outdoor recreation department. Uh, one of the other things I've uh, been doing is a little bit of writing. And uh, the book that I wrote in 2015 was called Active Vancouver. And the whole idea of the book was when people are recreating outside that they learn about the natural world while they're outside recreating. And so I tried to ground people in a place at the time. It turns out this year I've been on sabbatical and on my sabbatical project, I decided uh, my project was going to be to write a second book. And uh, it's a wildlife viewing book for Southern British Columbia. And so my head has been for the last year in species like gray whales and great blue herons and Pacific herring and bats and snakes and, and the like. And so I've spent an entire year focused on wildlife and on ecological ideas that center around that, that wildlife. And so it's been quite a wonderful year being able to focus on wildlife all the time uh, and, uh, and learn and learn so much. So I'm gonna get right to it. And uh, I know that I have about 40, 40 minutes or so to go through a few slides with the idea of trying to help people consider what to think about when you're thinking about listening to bird song, bird calls, or getting up early in the morning at 5.49 on Sunday morning at sunrise uh, for a dawn chorus. Um, one of the things that helps me are different apps, um, different tools. And although I really uh, see that we can really get a lot of the natural world without technology, um, there is no doubt that when I'm trying to engage my students 
one of the things I do is engage in technologies that they're familiar with. And uh, often apps on their phone are one of those things. And so a lot of my students won't carry a bird book with them anymore. They just want to be able to see it on their phone. And if that's the case, then I suggest the Merlin bird app. So I don't know how many of you have a Merlin app already on your phone, but if you don't, it is really something worth getting for the sounds, the calls that the birds make and for photo for, for ID. And the uh, companion site to Merlin is called All About Birds and that would be the online site. What I'd like to introduce here tonight is uh, John Neville because I am an intermediate birder at best. Um, I just love the natural world and birds. And in, uh, I've learned so much from so many people, but when it comes to bird song, I've learned more from John Neville than anybody. And uh, so I want to introduce John Neville's recordings tonight. The other thing I'd like to do is uh, introduce a not yet a well-known bird call app. I've been waiting for this to be developed for 10 years um, and, uh, and, and it has. Last year, I think maybe last March was the first year of this app came out and it's a sound identification, meaning you turn it on and record the bird sound that's singing near you and it has a database that it analyzes the bird call and gives you its best guess. And so far, I'm finding it 90 to 95% accurate. And so I'm really quite impressed with that. And I have now 100 calls on my phone that I've recorded through this bird net. And then the last one I just want to mention is the app called Seek. It's connected to iNaturalist. And I would really also recommend for people to look at iNaturalist accounts if you are um, it's a free account. If you are going and spending time outside and you want to contribute to a wider community, what it is you're seeing in what areas. And I tend to find I use it, especially when I find that I'm seeing things that I believe are quite unique. So last year up at Bunsen Lake, we happen to live in uh, the Tri-Cities at Bunsen Lake. I was coming down off the mountain and saw a little lizard called a Northern Alligator Lizard. So right away, I knew that that was a fairly unique thing to see up there. I take a picture of it, post it to iNaturalist. So people, um, the community, the wired earth science community has an understanding of the range of where the Northern Alligator Lizard lives. Anyway, back to Seek. Seek is one of these great tools where you hold your phone up to a plant, like I did today with a cascara. And <coughs> It's really good at coming up with the proper uh, name for a plant. So um, those are tools for you for when you do go outside and you experience the natural world. <laughs> All right. The other tool that I've used long before <laughs> apps were ever created um, is a bird checklist. And I've always used mine from the Vancouver Natural History Society, now called Nature Vancouver. And what I love about it is that it is a checklist that doesn't just say the birds, but it shows you with the thickness of the bars, how abundant those birds are in what months of the year. So at the top, there's January, February, March, April, May, and it goes on. And you can see something like a crow is abundant all year long, but a vireo comes in in about May, it's quite abundant, but then by the late August, it's, it, it goes. So here's a few that we're going to talk about tonight. Black capped chickadee, well, here all year round. Pacific wren, same thing. Uh, golden crown kinglet, Swainson's thrush. Well, it's, Swainson's thrush is a good one because that doesn't come in for another three weeks. So uh, mark your calendars from about May 19th or so to about May 29th. Sometime within those 10 days, the Swainson's thrush is going to come in. So you won't hear it in the dawn chorus on Sunday. They're still coming up from South America. And, but, but by May 19th, they, will, they may be just about that time arriving. 
And it is among the prettiest songs. And it's that one song that I have in this presentation tonight that I'm going to play that we won't hear on Sunday. All the other ones are possibilities for Sunday morning. Buried Thrush, Black Throat and Gray Warbler, which came into my uh, uh, backyard um, of my, my complex uh, just this week. So brand new um, this week uh, and warblers, different warblers. So uh, really recommend to get a seasonal checklist. You can find this checklist online. Okay, here is something quite cool to pay attention to. Um, and this is the live bird migration maps that are run on BirdCast right now. So this comes from Cornell Labs again. This is uh, as of uh, yes, uh, yesterday, this is April 30th, 3.05 Eastern Standard Time, so midnight last night. And you can see 196 million, 0.8 million birds are in the sky over the US flying and you can kind of primarily see the directions that they're going. And to me, this gives you an idea of what is happening, what birds are starting to push their way in to British Columbia from the south in their migration. And uh, uh, the map goes day by day. So you can just sort of see what it was like on April 20th and April 25th and April 30th and uh, go forward um, from there. So uh, have a look at this. I actually have a link in here to play this, but I think I'm gonna ask people to do it um, after this presentation because I'm, I'm aware of time. Okay, so maybe some tips for uh, learning bird song. Um, after you downloaded the app for Merlin, um, one of the beauties of the app is that it really just asks you questions. You don't have to say, oh, I saw this particular type of bird um, or, and flip through pages in a book. The app asks you, where are you? Which generally it knows anyway, because it's got your location. When are you there? What size is the bird? And when it says size, it, th it says things like sparrow size, robin size, crow size, or hawk size. All you have to do is say within uh, those ranges, what are the three main colors that you see on it? And what is it doing? Is it in the trees? Is it on the ground? Is it soaring overhead? And as long as you can answer those questions, it gives you its best guess as to what the bird is. Fantastic app to try if you haven't got it yet. Um, most birds are active early morning and evening. I recommend if you are in a place where you can open your window at night, you will, like Carmen said, start hearing the robins and possibly the chickadees by tomorrow morning at 4.30 before the sun even comes up. Now, that's the sun to us. Um, the fact is those birds are responding. If they're responding at 4.30 and we look out the window and it's still dark, to them, they're already noticing the first daylight that's coming in from, from the day. And so they're, they're aware that it's moving to crepuscular time, the time period between black of night and the, uh, the dawn of the morning. Um, of course, sitting outside in the evenings at 7 p.m., if you can start doing that when the swings and thrush comes in, um, it will be a treat. It is beautiful to sit outside as the swings and thrush is calling in the evenings. Uh, I would say uh, be purposeful in your listening. Really stop, be still, listen. Um, maybe move a little slower when it comes to listening. So be more purposeful in the listening aspect uh, of what you're hearing. And if you have that BirdNet app, you can record it and then go back to it later because sometimes warblers, they all start to blend together and they sound alike. But really, we only get about six or seven common warblers here. And once you figure out those six or seven, it's uh, quite a treat to discern them one from the next. So let's maybe start with bird songs that you probably already know. A lot of people already are aware of songs like this. And Carmen, if you could just confirm with me that you can hear this uh, um, clearly. And 
Carmen, could you hear that? Yep. Yes, we can hear that. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So an American Robin. Cheerie, cheerie up, cheerie, cheerie up. A lot of people may know that call, but maybe they don't know what it's connected to. Or a crow, which is more of a caw, caw, caw. Or the guttural song of a the sound call of a raven, which is more of a oh, oh, kind of sound. And so a lot of these, we have to re remember that we probably know a lot of a lot of sounds already. Same goes with some of these. Um, bald eagle. Regular gulls or a Canada goose. Now, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm just going to uh, hit this link to the Eagle Cam and Delta. Um, one of the chapters that I wrote in my uh, book is on bald eagles. And maybe, Carmen, you can tell me whether you are able to see this live screen here. Are you able to see an eagle with uh, eagle nest? I'm, I hear something, but I'm not seeing it. No. Okay. That's that's fine. Um, I'm going to go back to my slideshow. Okay. So on the screen, what I'm going to suggest people might want to do after this is to go to the Hancock Wildlife Foundation, and you can see tonight, right now, it's a beautiful low light of day on this nest at the moment. And there's an eagle with two chicks. And uh, the eagle is, um, uh, has been feeding it all week. And let's go back to that there. Um, and the eagle's been feeding the chicks all week. I put it on every now and then when I'm on the computer seeing what's going on. But you can hear the eagle. It calls a lot. So if you want to hear an eagle call from an eagle on its nest, um, have a look at the Hancock Wildlife Foundation Eagle Cam this week because I think it's maybe um, People can tell me what you think this call is when I play it. Hey, go ahead, too. Play it one more time. All right. I see that. People are coming up in uh, chickadee, cheeseburger, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cheeseburger, chickadee, chickadee, black eyes. <laughs> this is a group that knows what they're talking about. You are correct, um, a black cap chickadee. So here's a challenge for you, and I haven't perfected this challenge yet, is if you know a black cap chickadee, know that there's also chestnut back chickadees around Vancouver. <laughs> Try to learn what the difference is in the sound between a chestnut back chickadee and a black cap chickadee. Um, they are slightly, they are slightly different, and uh, perhaps use that all about bird sight or the Merlin app to uh, to figure it uh, to figure out what the difference in the calls are. Another one would be the Pacific Wren really long song that kind of goes for eight or nine or ten seconds and it's typically in the forest if you walk in a forested area around your home uh right now at this time of year there'll be this little bird sitting about 10 anywhere between five and ten meters off the ground and the male is just singing its little heart out and it's really quite a beautiful little bird to watch. So I'm now going to introduce you to John Neville. And this is a, a CD. Um, John Neville has a website. And uh, he is uh, somebody who uh, uh, writes in BC Nature. If you're a member of a local naturalist organization, you may already be familiar with John Neville's name. And he's been recording bird sounds in British Columbia for quite a number of years, certainly more than 15, 20 years. Uh, since I've started learning, and, he, and not just in British Columbia, around the world. 
So let's hear what John has to say about the Pacific Rim. The brilliance of this winter wren song is sometimes in contrast to the still, often somber atmosphere of the forest. Another male can be heard countersinging from a neighboring territory. So I'll be really curious if anybody on Sunday morning, if you happen to live close to a forest, um, our forest is out your back door. I'd uh, be curious to see if anybody comes up with winter or Pacific Rim that morning. Um, let's try another one of these. Okay, so uh, I will play a bird call and uh, let's, I'm going to watch the chat and let's see what uh, people think it is. So I'm just going to watch the chat and see what people are coming up with. Uh, clearly, <laughs> um, there are people who know what this is. And uh, let's hear what John Neville has to say. Toy trumpet-like notes herald the present. Okay, toy trumpet-like notes. Does it sound toy trumpet-like? <laughs> so that's the other thing about bird calls. If you can connect them with something that will help you remember, um, then you will hold on to that much easier. So think of this one as a toy trumpet. Okay, back to John. ...of a red-breasted nuthatch in the forest. <laughs> Very good. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought it was on the screen. There it is there. So red, red breasted nut hatch is what we have here. There are uh, three kinds of nut hatches in North America, uh, a white breasted and a pygmy, but the most common here on the west coast of British Columbia is the red breasted nut hatch. Um, that might be something, I would hear this in the morning, by the way. Um, so on Sunday morning, this is a possibility. I happen to live next to a ravine and so I know that these tend to be down in the ravine. Golden Crown Kinglet is uh, a, another. Um, I love this one because it's a really, really high pitch um, sound at the highest parts of the trees, up high in the canopy. But what I love about it is the sound that it makes that I think of like a bouncing ball, where a bouncing ball would go as it gets closer to the ground, it bounces faster. Listen to this uh, and what John has to say. The Golden Crown Kinglet song is a musical phrase of soft, thin notes, which it sings from high in the canopy. Now, I wonder how many people recognize that sound. We often hear it, but don't always see it because it's small and high up. But boy, is it ever a treat when you get a chance to see a little golden crown kinglet. Um, do we have a little, uh, do we have a thing that shows hands or thumbs up or something where people could, how many people have seen or listened, had a chance to listen to a golden crown kinglet? Is there a way to see how many people uh, have done that? Yep. <laughs> Gail says yes. Debbie, same thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Lots, lots of people. Fantastic. Okay. One more uh, set here. <coughs> this might be one of my last ones to, to, to try you on. So let's try this one. So more of a flute, sort of a single whistle, but then the whistle goes a higher pitch and maybe a lower pitch. And, uh, a bird that you would often find and again in a forest environment. So if you're lucky enough to have a forest around you, um, let's see what that is. Buried thrush. And uh, well done, those of you who are buried thrush. Uh, listening to John Neville, 
In the middle of May, the snow line reaches down to about 1,000 meters on the Seashelf Peninsula. I was surprised to find Wilson's warblers, juncos, and rufous hummingbirds at the snow line. But what I remember most is the varied thrush singing in the mist with the snow melting all around. John just said something that I think is is important, and it's sometimes the memories that you associate with a place, a beautiful, spiritual, peaceful location that you're in. Sometimes it's the sound that really grounds it in place, and you can't forget it. And as he says, the thing that I remember most, you know, was the sound of the very thrush. And to me, it opens up an entirely new world when you have the opportunity to be able to use your ears to experience the environment just like you do with your eyes. And I feel for people who don't know that, who go out into the natural world and they don't know to use this extra sense that they have because there's an entirely new way of experiencing uh, the world with your ears. Okay, um, this is one you likely won't hear on Sunday unless for some reason it's migrated early. But as I said, mark your calendars for about May 19th to 20th and listen to this sound. <laughs> Now, I got to ask, there's got to be people, please uh, use the thumbs if you, uh, same thing, if you recognize that sound. Um, to me, this it really is one of my favorite sounds. And on that day when this bird arrives, um, it's a pretty special day. And uh, then I go and I look at a, at, at a migration map and I see where the bird has come from. And I see that a lot of the West Coast birds come from Central and South America. So as far South as, as Argentina, um, sorry, Venezuela. Um, so really quite something when we get this uh, bird arriving on our, uh, in our trees. So listen at the last week of May. Right now at this time of year, a whole series of warblers are calling. And my guess is on Sunday morning, some of you will record some of these warblers. The one that I think will be most likely to be recorded is the yellow rumped warbler. But I do know that the Townsend's warblers already arrived. I haven't heard the orange crowned warbler yet this year. If you live near water, the yellow warbler is very likely and Within three weeks, the Wilson's warbler will be one of them, often one of the most common ones. So let's just listen to the yellow rumped warbler. So that recording that you just heard is me using my BirdNet app. And I recorded that just out back of my house in the ravine. So there's a creek there and it creates a little bit of noise and I'm not that far from a road, so the road has a little bit of noise, but you can still clearly tell that there's a bird out there. So I'm gonna play it again. Not, this is nothing special. Like I've got no acoustic dishes or anything. I'm just using my phone. So I'll play that one more time. And that's the kind of thing I think we'll probably be hearing on Sunday morning. You're going to upload them to the site and my guess is I'm gonna be stumped on some of these because I haven't heard them since last spring. So I'm gonna to try to review between now and Sunday just to get them all back in my head. But the reality is they all are fairly similar or similar enough that you can mix them up. But boy, oh boy, when the warblers come in, it uh, is a, a real pleasure to be able to have them uh, uh, in your, in your uh, trees outside of your home. And it really is this week. Like uh, I don't have on here the black-throated gray, which just came into uh, my property 
day before yesterday. That was the first day I heard it. And, and so um, there are a few others as well. Um, okay. I don't imagine that um, all of these birds you'll be able to hear come Sunday morning. But, so unless you live by a river, you probably won't hear the belt and kingfisher. But if you have a hummingbird feeder, your chances of hearing a hummingbird on Sunday morning are really pretty good. Um, maybe not quite at 5.49 a.m. because Rufus hummingbirds or Anna's hummingbirds go into torpor at night and it takes them a little bit of time to come out in the morning. So you need to get the, another hour probably later in the morning from the immediate sunrise until you start hearing a hummingbird. But see if you recognize this sound. Hopefully that's coming through clear enough. A lot of people don't realize that hummingbirds are calling around us all the time. Because they don't recognize the hummingbird, because they're so fast and so small, they don't realize that, that hummingbirds really are all around us. And uh, once you start to know their sound, you, it just opens up your world. You go for a walk and it becomes almost one of the most common sounds you hear on your walk um, in some places. Belted kingfisher, if you are out by, a, as I said, by a river or on a lake, like this. Yes. My students used to say that sounded like a, like a, a machine gun and it was the, the way that they remembered it. Um, Stellar's jays. Really raucous call. And uh, towhees, and I would think that uh, some of us will hear spotted towhees on Sunday. So this would be one that I would anticipate we would hear. Either that sound or this sound. Uh, or so you listen for both. Um, I really actually should have Junko on here too, because a Junko is another possibility um, uh, come Sunday as well. Ultimately, one of the one of the things that I'd like to encourage people to do is to do this for the wider community, even beyond yourself. So share it with others, children. As you start learning bird sounds, find other people in your networks and in your lives to share it with, to get more people to understand and appreciate and ultimately value the birds that are around us. And if you don't, um, if you're not sure exactly what the motivation is for this, go onto the website 3 billionbirdsorg And it's a study that was done where they looked at the amount of birds in, in North America and how they've changed between 1970 and 2020. And in those 50 years, the amount of birds that we've lost and so connected to that website, though, is another one called Seven Simple Actions to Help Birds. And if you haven't seen the site yet, please have a look at Seven Simple Actions to Help Birds. It's from Cornell Labs, and it really gives clear understanding to people about what we could do personally for the birds that are around us. I am a big believer in trying to post to the wider community. So eBird is one way to go. iNaturalist is another. I'm not sure I shouldn't say either or, it could be both. But the idea is to get what you're seeing out there to the wider community. The reason why we know 3 billion birds are, we're, we have 3 billion fewer birds in the last 50 years is because of people doing Christmas bird counts, mostly through the Audubon Society in the last 50 years. And so, um, yeah, it, one thing just to learn more about. So with that said, I kind of said that I'd be done by about um, 7.45, which is where we're at now. That way it could open it up to uh, questions and to allow Jesse to be able to provide some 
a tutorial or some advice on how people can upload bird songs on Sunday. Because those of you who want to join us again on Sunday night and share what it is that we heard on Sunday morning, um, we'll have an opportunity to do that as well. But before we go, one more test. Let's see what we uh, what we've got here. Okay, I'm going to watch the chat and let's see what people think that bird is. I'll play it one more time. And any ideas? Yeah, so somebody said Pacific Wren with a question mark. You are correct. It's Pacific Wren. So well, uh, well done, uh, Lynn. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then I'm going to uh, open it up. Maybe I'm going to uh, open it back to Carmen. And Carmen, is this oh, is it okay just to have a question and answer? And if people want to ask a question, maybe what I do is say unmute yourself, ask the question, and then go back on mute again. Does that make sense? Yeah, that would be great. And maybe we can do a couple of minutes of like five minutes of questions, and then let Jesse tell us about how we can upload our bird songs. That sounds good. And yeah. thank you everybody for being so interested in bird songs. This is this is great. It's, it's odd for me to just do this on Zoom, and I always I, I love being I'd love to be in Redford Ravine with you right now doing this, but maybe that will be in a future year. Yes, we're certainly hoping so. Do we have any questions for Roy? Well, you know what? I'm also going to look on the chat just to see if anybody's asked there yeah. too. So, uh, somebody says, we, uh, Jennifer says, we have song sparrows in uh, Renfrew Ravine. Yes, so I didn't play song sparrow uh, just now, but if you, uh, you get the Merlin app, uh, John Neville says, it sounds like maids, 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 kind of sound. <laughs> And uh, so everybody has a oh, a way to to uh, to remember it. Um, I kept wondering who was blowing a whistle while hiking all summer. I'll bet it was the very thrush. Um, I spoke with my wife the other night when we were out for a walk, and I wondered how many people have been on fields, playing fields, playing soccer, and then stopped the game because the very thrush whistled, and they thought that it was a referee's whistle because it's very similar. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you suggest using Merlin calls to attract birds? No, I certainly do not. Um, so in fact, uh, if you if you hear a bird and you are unsure what it is, um, I recommend having Merlin in the field uh, with you, but I also recommend turning your volume down low and listen to the bird that you think it is, but out of range of the bird that's singing. Because what you don't wanna do is play another bird call, which essentially is a challenge to the male bird that is already calling. And so they will probably change their behavior because you're playing a call. And I don't think that that's really ethically appropriate um, and let alone putting on a call just so you can have the experience of bringing a bird in to see it. I don't think that's okay. Um, so I, I have a sort of standards where I really feel like we have to be so very respectful of birds. They are already dealing with a lot of the crap that we are putting out there um, that they, they didn't ask for. And so that just adds something else. Somebody else? Um, will owls be calling at dusk or at night at this time of the year? 
Uh, good question. Uh, owls will be calling, but owls actually started calling quite a bit earlier. As far as I understand, and I, I don't know specifically which owls, but owls generally start calling in about mid-February. And so their time for calling is actually more coming to, I wouldn't say to an end, because you can still hear them in the summertime when you're camping. But uh, they're much, they're more prolific uh, in the earlier part of the season. Um, do you have any recommendations for recording the dawn course on Sunday? Yeah, download BirdNet. Um, up until about last fall, it couldn't be downloaded on iPhones, but I understood from one of my students that there has been an update and it's changed. So you can now download it with Android or iPhones. So I, yeah, I think BirdNet's the way to go um, just because it's so accurate uh, with what it seems to be uh, suggesting. Um, when and where is the best time to hear a night jar calling? Oh my goodness, I was on another Zoom talk and somebody was an expert on night jars and they said, we have lost so many night jars that used to be here in the Vancouver area. So honestly, around my home, I've never seen one in the Tri-Cities but I'm told they used to be here. Um, I would probably put it out to this community and I would ask anybody in the community here, can anybody answer on the chat where we, you might see night jars? I know I saw them in Tofino last year. I see them in the Okanagan and Merritt around our uh, around a family cabin, but around Vancouver, I don't know, maybe Iona, South Richmond, Delta, but their habitat's been taken away from them here for the most part. Um, any po possible reason for birds, possibly chickadees, chattering furiously at around 10 a.m. these days? Yep, birds will, will still be chatting a lot in the middle of the day, absolutely. Uh, you'll hear swallows now all day uh, during the day. Chickadees are, are active all day. Um, Often the Phoebe song is more morning and night. Um, and then the DDD, that's actually a, um, I didn't talk about this tonight, but there's a difference between bird song and bird call. Maybe on Sunday when we meet again, I'll have a quick discussion on the difference between bird song and bird call as we listen to what people recorded. Uh, will warblers call in gardens on migration or only when they get to a suitable territory for nesting? Um, I don't really know the answer to that because when I hear warblers, they're coming into their territory for nesting. And uh, my guess is they're not going to expend extra energy if it's not their mating season. So I kind of think it's more they're building space for their territory and to call a mate, um, mostly. But if somebody else has another thought on that, by all yes, means. Yes, they are singing all the time. My in migration. All the time. So all even, the if, time, you, yeah. even if you today, went to Central America and found the warbler, you would still be singing? I'm not sure about that one, but here, like the Townsend's warbler migrating through Burnaby Lake, they are singing. Okay. Okay. Very good. And yellow run the same thing, they will go away to nest sites and they are very vocal. Very good. Thank you. and singing. Okay, maybe just a couple more questions. Why do Northern flickers hammer on metal chimneys? Because it makes a great hollow sound and the hollow sound is what they're looking for um, when they are trying to attract a mate. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it has to do with breeding season, which is why it starts in about early March, um, maybe even late February for flicker. Um, I think somebody suggested Rifle Island maybe for night jars. And uh, they've seen it around where the Hope Slide is and on Galliano Island. Oh my goodness, Galliano Island, what a beautiful place to watch birds. Um, okay, I think it's a good time then to move it over to Jesse and ask Jesse to take up the lead here in the last five minutes because I don't see any other questions. And if there's anything burning as a question, put it in the chat and we'll see if we can answer it before we go. Thank you so much, Roy. So I'm just gonna send the link to the Google form. Um, so on this link, um, 
you can put your name and upload all of your snippets there. And I'm going to be emailing all of you guys through Eventbrite with this link, as well as some of the links that Roy recommended for you all to use to record your recordings. And um, if any chance, if you have troubles uploading, you can feel free to email me at jesse at stillmoonarts.ca. My contact email is also on that form. Maybe one question I would have, Jesse, is when you upload an audio file, will they always kind of come through as WAV files or MP3s or will, accept, will, will we be able to use any of those kinds of extensions for files? Mm -hmm. So on the upload um, option, I allowed like any type of file. So it could be a video or MP4 um, audio file. And you can upload up to five um, files and um, max is 100 MB. So I would say for the recordings, maybe try to aim at the most one minute, like 30 seconds to one minute or less. And Honestly, I tend to find when I record a bird call, it's rarely more than 10 seconds anyway. Um, and, and so you can, you know, you can start your recording when the bird's calling. It doesn't really last for very long and maybe it'll take a pause and then it'll sing again. And maybe at most that will be within 15 seconds. So it shouldn't have any reason for having people record for an entire minute. That's probably not necessary. <laughs> and when it comes to Sunday and we're listening to bird calls, it would be really good to not have a lot of blank space to have the calls themselves so multiple people can share. For sure. And um, Carmen and Roy, did you want me to also upload all of the recordings onto our website for everybody to be able to click on and view or um, listen maybe during the meeting or would we be like sharing like we would be playing them on i think own. it would be ideal if they could get uploaded to the website i imagine if we have a ton of people uploading sending in the form you might not get it all completed by the evening but hopefully people will be able to send them in and you can upload them if um but we may not get through them all if everybody's uploading multiple ones so yeah Mm -hmm, for sure. And I just see in the chat that there were some problems accessing the form. I think um, I, okay, is it all good now? I think the settings was um, switched to just people in the organization. Make a Google yeah, I think form. Varsha changed it to public so anybody can upload it up to it now. Okay. And Jennifer, um, if you have troubles, you can also email me your recordings and your name as well. And does um, anyone else have any questions about uploading or, or I can also type my email here just in case, but I'll be emailing everyone after the meeting. And Roy, um, do you have some suggestions about places we could go to listen to bird songs early in the morning? Because mm. we could just stick our heads out the windows um, mm. and hear what's in our neighborhood. But if are there particular parks or places that would be worth going for an early morning drive or walk or bicycle to go to go listen? Yeah, yeah there's uh, so uh, two things you can do. Um, open up a Metro Vancouver Parks map and uh, have a look and see what Metro Vancouver Park is closest to where you live. Um, and if you could be in a general vicinity around where that or um, ravine, golf courses, that sort of thing, if, if you could, yeah, if that's relatively close to you, then I would recommend that would be good. Um, and then I guess the, the other thing to do is if you any, are anywhere around water, um, so if you're in the West End, close to the ocean, uh, if you're around a ravine that has a, a running creek in it, um, try to get into an area close to there because there's a possibility that you'll capture the sounds of birds that will be different than other people who are doing it in their front lawn, for instance, um, or, at, or in a forest environment. So um, that would be kind of interesting. I just think we'll get a more diverse amount of birds. So yeah, get a map of Metro Vancouver Parks or just go on Google 
or Google uh, Maps, go to the satellite um, lens, and then look at Metro Vancouver and say, okay, where do I live? And where is the greatest area of trees around where I live? Uh, if you're not sure already, because those are gonna be the places that will have the most birds. Birds are kind of in a city like this, pushed into the areas that are the most forested environments um, that have the best habitat for them. Any other questions? So I'm gonna, before I go then, I'm just going to say, um, I'm put a challenge out to everybody here. If you think you know one other person on Sunday morning who will be crazy enough and willing to get up at 5.45 to go out on the dawn course, let them know between now and Sunday what it is you're doing. And suggest a couple of the things we um, we talked about here tonight and see if we can get even more people recording bird song on Sunday morning to come back on Sunday at, uh, Carmen, is it 5 p.m.? What time do we come back on, on Sunday? It was 7 p.m., wasn't that 7. right, Jesse? Yeah. Uh, that's good. Sunday night at 7 p.m., see if we could get more people because, and and really, I, not everybody has their cameras on, but I don't know if there's any children in here. And if there's not, is there a way that we could get some youth in here on Sunday night? Because that's what we need. <laughs> we need the youth. So just a challenge to the group here. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank everyone, you, everyone. Too. And we look forward to hearing your recordings. Um, and um, seeing everybody on on uh, Sunday evening at 7 p.m. with and we can have a little chat about what we heard and happy birding to everyone. Um, I'm just saying if we if we get some good recordings, um, part of what we do as artists is I'm also going to look into maybe passing some of the recordings on to some audio artists and maybe we can actually make some audio art out of the recordings that we have collected together for the Dawn Chorus. This is something that's in the back of my mind that I'm hoping we can make a real into a reality eventually. So thank you everybody for participating. Very good. And uh, Carmen, and I have a quirks and quirks uh, um, from a couple months ago that somebody did just that um, in, as a piece, a, a mix between arts and science. I'm going to find it and send it to you. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. See you bye, on Sunday. Everyone. Bye. Um, Jesse, are you okay to uh, figure out the recording? Yeah, for sure. Okay, because yeah. then I'm, I'll um. I'm gonna stop recording.